Okay, it's been a while and been very busy, but things are going really well. And we're working on a new website. We're working on a exhibition for New York. We're also working on my own website and trying to get everything up to order and up to scratch for the past few months with all that's going on in the world right now. Um, I did want to do a short talk for people that were asking about hyperreality and self-perception. Uh, so, but also like the perception of self and the how we perceive through the mediums that we experience um, a topic or a subject. So in regards to the scope of say a photo shoot and uh, the subject might be a model and you have a perceived reality that you want someone to experience. So should the viewer, this is what advertising would do. Whether you do that through ethos, pathos and logos, so uh, the ethical perception, um, whether you want to change the perception of someone's viewpoints um, by realizing to the, the emotive um, path, pathos, which is uh, the pathological trying to relate to someone's, um, say, subconscious and say the deep set rooting, say, uh, rationale that we all have. And then we have, then we have the logos, which is the people to people's logic. So we we'll try to um, relate and align ourselves to others through the medium that we've chosen to, um, for them to experience. Such as if I've created a fellowship with a client, we might do, say, a certain model that we picked with a certain garment or with a certain makeup artist and, and designer and fashion designer, shaping everything to the perceived um, stories or perceived message, meaning and modes. So, when we're creating a campaign, it's not just doing a photo shoot. You're actually thinking about the ideals and the public perception, the way it's going to be absorbed and the context it's going to be absorbed in order to create that real, uh, well, false reality um, or a hyper reality, as we would so usually say. So an example of that would say you go to McDonald's and you look to buy a burger. You're not buying the burger that's given to you. You're buying the image on the board that you're seeing. And that's another thing of hyper reality. That burger may not have been actually cooked. It might have been painted. It might have been photoshopped. It might have been photographed in different layers. It may even be CGI and composites. So these things that we see every day around us are part of our everyday life. And I think it's something that people should be educated about especially from, um, a, a, say, a school level and from year 12 or younger, because you're absorbing these, um, these imagery every single day and videos as well now, which are, can be CGI and edited and, and changed. And it's important for people to feel, realize that these are not real. They are messages, they are art, they are, um, they are advertising, they are for means and purpose. Whether it's good, whether it's bad, that's up to the viewer and up to the context and also into uh, the disciplines of the person that's creating it. So I was talking about how we uh, can create things in through hyper reality in regards to just being Photoshop and manipulation. It can come from the very bare bones of the way someone acts, uh, how they hold themselves in front of the camera. Um, it could be a persona they're putting on. It could be the makeup sh shaded doing um, contour work or highlighting. Um, we can even do change the hair to create different moods. We could do a slick back mohawk to create more of a, of a dominant um, look, um, whereas we might, the person might be want this perceived as submissive. Um, but then we can talk about the actual posing, um, whether I'm posing the model or the model is posing a certain way uh, to be either provocative or whether it's to be unluring or whether it's to be um, strong and, and um, matriarchal. So we can really change the perception of ourselves and also um, for others to perceive us in certain ways by the way we hold ourselves. Then we have our extra toolkits, which which would be um, the actual lighting. So lighting can shape everything. Um, it can fill in shadows, can fill in pores. It can get rid of, of uh, deep, deep sets, um, say contours. It can really open up a person's um, uh, face or uh, the person that you're photographing to be perceived as well. So I really enjoy the aspect of lighting because you can change a lot of a person or well even just the, the stories you're trying to tell um, by changing lighting I can simply turn these two lights off on the side and they'll become shadowy and darker and grungier and that gives a whole new message to what I would like to create as well. Then we get our lens choice. Our lens can either shorten, widen and and really distort um, the lens that you're viewing through. So right now you're viewing through a 50 mil lens and the 50 mil lens is very close to the human eye, which is around about 52, 55, if I remember correctly. And that way we don't get any distortions. It's how you would see me one-on-one. -on -one. And that way you, you interact with this video in a different way um, that you would with say a 24 to 70 mil lens on a very um, long focal lens with the background would be fully blurred out if it's shot in 2.8. So 
our lens choice does shape the reality that you're perceiving as well as well so if i did that it wouldn't be a real experience it'd be a created experience so you you don't just necessarily review people with a blurred background unless you're really really close to them of course if you look at your hand and the background becomes blurred so again you're shaping realities again through that by creating focal points in the areas that you want the clients or the, the, the viewer or the perceiver to view so then we go into angle so the angle in which we photograph someone or video someone can actually shape how we perceive that person too, whether it's dominant, submissive, um, whether it's going to be a leading role, and whether you want it to be quite abstract. So you can create stories just by the angles that you photograph someone. If I photograph someone from the, on the ground with their boot above my head compared to photographing from above where they're set down below me, it's a whole new different um, story just by changing the angle. Then we go into aperture. So aperture is a photo photographic technique within the lens where we can actually open the, the iris of the actual um, lens itself to let more light in or less light in, but also creates a depth of field. A depth of field means either the foreground or the background can be more blurred or less blurred, and something can be in shorter focus or more focus. And that can actually help us to focus on certain topics and or focus on the subject that we want the viewer to focus on. So if I was photographing something in the distance and I sorry, something in the foreground, and I didn't want the background to be too involved in, in the communication, I can blur it out, knock it out, and therefore we focus on the subjects at hand. We can do that with audio as well, like such as using the lapel mic, and we can use that, do that with lighting as well, by just focusing the lighting in and making the background darker in certain areas too. Then we go into color and black and white. It's, this is before we go into, um, say, um, distortion um, or warping or post-production in general. Um, black and white, you experience the image completely differently to what you would with a color image because you are taking that person out of reality. Um, they're experiencing something that they would never look at um, through the normal eye, which would be through color or whether the color blind, I don't know, but still we see in majority color. So as seeing a black and white image, you are automatically taken out of the reality that you're in and you have to observe and view that topic in a different way just because it's being in black and white. Then we go into editing and post-production in regards to hyper-reality. This is what the, the stickler that everyone can tends to focus on and you can definitely shape and change and in a multitude of ways and do whatever you want in regards to post-production within the ethical reasonings of oneself. And I find that myself, I would edit an image to the client's needs and I will pull it back a bit and put in the original um, image as well and overlay that to give it some sense of reality. Um, I don't try to over post-production um, my imagery. I try to keep them as authentic as I possibly can. And that's just a personal choice. And then you know, also for the, my client's choices as well. So it's doing things within means, as long as someone can perceive themselves and see their imagery as themselves. Um, but then if it's created for a story or it's created for a campaign, then that image can be edited towards that story as long as everybody knows that's what's happening. So the means to alter and change and the um, a body shape or form can be within the context of that story. And that's where the iffy line gets. So this is why I think that people should be educated that imagery and post-production and photography is art and it should be perceived as not real because it is not real. It is altered. It's altered perception. It is hard, artificial. It's hyper-reality. And if we can continue that message and people can adopt that message and be more understanding of what they're absorbing every day, maybe we might have a bit more of a healthier mindset um, towards ourselves and also towards photography or artwork in general and to perceive and enjoy artwork rather than being the victim of it. And I think that's quite important for us to take away and to um, really try to acknowledge and start to understand and educate. Um, after we got post-production, we've got the medium that it's viewed on, whether it's viewed on a computer screen, whether it's viewed on your mobile, whether it's viewed in a magazine or a billboard or wherever it might be, the medium that it's viewed on is going to change the user experience again. Um, so if I see an imagery in a magazine on a really bad paper, I'm not going to see it as being high end or high quality and it's for a purpose, it might be for a, a, band, a band show or something, that, a throwaway magazine or if you've got a big band post, it might be on a, a different stock and it's got impact, it's got color, it's got halftone, it's got um, hyper, hyper color, things like that. 
And then we could say it could be viewed on a cinematic screen. Massive imagery, beautiful colors like that. We're using RGB colors rather than CMYK. Then we get into a whole new scope of your experiences change again. So the, the medium that you view it on is very important. But then the most important, I think, is the context in which something is viewed. Whether you're gonna be viewing that within a gallery setting, whether you're viewing it at home, whether you, you're viewing it um, out in the public, the context in which something's created, whether it's gonna be next to something or whether it's a standalone piece, um, it's gonna have its own message as opposed to being aligned or contrasted with other work. So to understand the context of it is, is important. Then we go into the hyper-reality how it's perceived, how it's absorbed, and how it's adopted. So the person viewing it might hold certain values or perceptions and understandings. And when we have that, then it can be skewed, it can be twisted, it can be shaped by the person absorbing it because their messages might not be the same as a message being communicated through visual communication. Because if a people's signs signifies and signifies and you know, in symbology is always different to the individual, um, whether it's a learned symbology or whether it's an adopted symbology or whether it's a cultural symbology or it could even be something that's um, ingrained in us for as the human ethos and how to be absorbed something as well. So the person viewing it can shape and distort that reality again to their own means. So again, it's important about context and, and the, the means and the message and the purpose for it is initially created might not always be how, how it's perceived at the end. So we have to be very careful how we create imagery and be very understanding of where these images are going and shape it where it's going as well. So when we start to absorb, we, we tend to appropriate, disprove or absorb. Um, so I find it's important for someone to absorb the imagery in a positive way or positive light by creating the setting that they view it. And I, I prefer my imagery to be viewed in a gallery that I've curated to create um, an understanding of the work, the context of the work, and an environment that can absorb the work in the best possible light. And that way you can get the best possible outcomes. Um, because I think it's all about um, understanding humans and other persons and you know your next door neighbor, your friend, your foe, whoever it may be. And just try to get along and try to create messages that are fun and engaging. Thank you.